Walking a path along the roots of Pikes Peak, the moonlight on the aspens makes you think of lines from Auden. Or maybe it was Elliot. Hopkins? Eh, at any rate, you turn a, at a fork in the road toward the Anselm Society Digital Pub. Inside is a raucous conversation on the arts, faith, and which Rossetti was the better Rossetti. At a corner table, by the fire, are three people. One of them is reading the opening lines of Beowulf in an Anglo-Saxon accent. It isn't working. That person is me, uh, your co-host, Matthew Melema, and welcome to the To Believe to See, a podcast of the Anselm Society. The Anselm Society is a coalition of churches across the Front Range of Colorado dedicated to one very simple goal, a renaissance of the Christian imagination. Uh, to further this goal, we do all sorts of things. Each spring... All this is COVID permitting, obviously. We have our a big Imagination Redeemed conference, which attracts folks from all across the country. Our next one is scheduled for this coming April the 21st. Cross your fingers, everyone. We also have a regular slate of concerts, lectures, and other events designed to foster love and understanding of arts and faith. And when the virus stops us from meeting in person, we do our best to provide this content online as well. And we also have our own Guild of Artists right here in Colorado Springs. And when we aren't creating art, some of us like to podcast. Therefore, believe to see. To find out more about the Anselm Society, please visit us at anselmsociety.org. And while you're there, you should check out Anselm's two other podcasts, Redeemed Imagination and Speaking with Joy. And since you're already doing stuff, maybe rate and review our show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Helps us a ton by increasing the visibility of the show and all the rest of the spiel that you should know by now. So this podcast, I am very, very excited about, not least because it's a long time coming based solely on <laughs> my own, <laughs> my own emailing deficiencies. Um, well, I should probably explain. Do you, any of you listeners have like that friend or work acquaintance who every time you email them, you know, there's like a 50, 50 chance they either won't respond or they'll respond like six months later with, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry for taking so long to respond. And then you realize that every one of your correspondence with this person, they start with apologies again for taking so long to respond. So that is exactly what is happening with this current podcast. So that our two guests today uh, sent me a message on Twitter a shamefully long time ago talking about some work they were doing and seeing if we could do some stuff with Anselm. And I looked at it, I was like, yes, this looks great. This all looks great. Let's do this. So I emailed them back saying we should do it, and then I dropped the ball for several months for no good reason I could articulate. I could make up some fake ones, but no good reason. But finally, all it took was a global pandemic for me to get back to them, and they were gracious enough to still want to talk to me. So we are welcoming them back to, well, not back, we're welcoming to the table, back to me corresponding with them like a normal adult should. And our guests are Clinton and Sarah Collister, Collister couple. Welcome to the Believe to See table. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for hosting us, Matt. It's fun to join you at the pub. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. My pleasure. So, And I actually think what? your timing was quite good. This is Sarah's first day of summer, so it is, yeah. it's, it's as if you planned it. Well, there we go. I can tell you guys have been living in England for a while because you're getting very good at uh, being gracious to your hosts and all the, all the manner stuff. That, that is a very <laughs> polite way to make the best of me uh, dropping the ball for so long. But Clinton and Sarah, it sounds like just uh, talking to you before we started recording, you, you run in a lot of the same circles that a lot of the Anselm folks do. So I suspect a lot of folks listening to this may either know you or like they know a friend of your friend or something like that. But for those of you who may not know that yet, why don't you two both introduce yourselves and uh, tell listeners what you what you all do? Right. So my name is Clinton Callister, as you stated, and my wife and I are living in St. Andrews right now because I'm working on an MLIT in Theology and the Arts. And there are some other Ansel members here, Joy Clarkson and yep. Joel Clarkson, go to church with us at All Saints. So oh, every okay. Wednesday, I, I, did I not have. I know the... you went to church with the Clarksons. That's great. Yeah. 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 So it, um, it really is a small on, on Wednesdays, when <laughs> yeah. the, the pandemic is not on, Joel and I uh, <laughs> usually are chatting over a croissant and a cup of coffee after a uh, Eucharist and joy hosts the scriptorium once a week here, which is kind of a okay. monkish time when people get together and write all day. And she uh, provides a nice lunch for us. So yeah, I, we know the Clarksons. And then back before we came here, I had a research fellowship at the 
Russell Kirk Center for Cultural Renewal. And I was studying the poetry of Jeffrey Hill, and we met Ashley Cowles there at one of the the lectures, and she mentioned that she was part of Anselm, and she also had studied at St. Andrews. Okay, it really is yeah. a small world. <laughs> and I'm Sarah, and we're married, obviously, and I'm a teacher. Hey, don't say obviously, teacher. because that <laughs> happens to the Clarksons all the time. They are not married, they are brother and sister. Let's make that very clear. But, uh, oh, please, please true, continue. yeah, that's true. And I'm an English teacher, I've been an English teacher for seven years, just finished my seventh year, and I love it. I love talking to young people about literature and also reading things that they've written and seeing them develop their own voice. And I think part of my love for literature is the way that it connects people to one another across time, but also in, you know, in the same time period. So yeah, we were both English majors, and I think that's definitely like the foundation for our our love and our romance is our yeah. love of words. When we met uh, Christian Wyman at the Calvin Festival of Faith and Writing, we told him that we read poems of his to each other when we were dating long distance. You know, so that was uh, awkward. You, you never know with those kind of conversations how they're going to go. Yeah. When we met, he was nice, but also thought it was a little funny. Yeah, I think he thought it was But funny. when we met Mary Carr, she told us we were going to have beautiful children and she loved us. So you never know. Uh, we got like a blessing from, yeah. from that poet. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Mr. Wyman, I just want you to know that you helped me woo my wife without realizing it. Thank you. Um, so like, this cool. is actually yeah. a conversation. I was an English major, too. And there was a lot of talk in the English major circles. Is it best for English majors to couple off together? Or do you want to try to, like, round things out, like marry an engineer or something? So, But it sounds like you guys double English. How is that treating you? <laughs> we love it. There are a lot of good books on our bookshelf and we enjoy, <laughs> you know, reading poetry together and, and meeting poets, like I said. But it's funny when Sarah told the English teacher who inspired her to study English about marrying me. What did she say? She was in a double English relationship as well. And she was like, oh, I'm so sorry. You'll never have any money. <laughs> 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 and yeah, I think... That aside, it's a wonderful life. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, it really, it really is totally worth it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you marry an English major yourself, Matt? <laughs> I did not. I did not. She is a, well, when I say it, now that I say that, it's kind of English adjacent. She's communications major, which has okay. a lot of English major skills, but they're able to make money, unlike us English majors. <laughs> so that, that, that helped to balance it out nicely. Um, oh, that's good. great. That's very good. We, I think we should start our own podcast, but just about English majors in the world and advice to them. <laughs> I, what One of the topics for today has to do with a lot of the work that you two are doing actively. One of the ways that we started communicating was about your podcast, Poetry for the People. Everybody check it out. It's on iTunes right now and wherever, I assume it's wherever else you get your podcasts. Yeah, and indeed. Spotify as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's I've listened to it. I think it's super good. I love the concept behind it. And I really want to make today's topic about your old podcast topic, which is bringing poetry to sort of normal, you know, non-English major people. So could you guys explain how you got into that and maybe the big picture goals of that podcast? Well, I think we were both teachers and the first year of our marriage, we were working at different schools, but we found that one of the good reads for culture is just when you talk to teenagers about something, what's their reaction to it? And you get a pretty good idea of whatever they think is what people in 50 years will think of, you know, this certain movie or this type of song or this book or this type of poetry. And I was noticing at the school I was teaching at that poetry, whenever you brought it up, I was like, we're, today we're going to talk about this poem by, you know, Wallace Stevens. There would just be this general groan in the room like, oh, poetry uh, is so yeah. boring. You know, <laughs> oh, it's so highfalutin and uh, whatever. You know, maybe the girls would, would kind of perk up, but the boys are just like, just slouch in their seats. Like, I can't believe we have to do this. And, you know, I only like... Uh, music, I don't like poetry, whatever. So I think just the general reaction to poetry being something that is boring and stilted and belongs in the academy and, you know, it has no relevance to my life. It's just this thing that's like in a textbook. 
I think that really awakened us to the the concern that poetry is actually a really strong cultural force, and it has been kind of the basis of culture for thousands of years. And it's a great way to understand who you are as an individual, but also how you connect to a greater group of people. And then even to, you know, maybe Christian society or Mm -hmm. to society as a whole or humankind. And so I think that idea that like they're missing something is really important to us. When, when those same boys who were initially skeptical, once you had read the Iliad and the Odyssey yeah. and the Aeneid and, and the Divine Comedy with them, that they no longer thought it was just like emotional venting that was for girls, right. but they actually really liked it. So and they got to experience the powerful force that is behind poetry. It's not just this, it's not just love poems. I think that's also mm-hmm. this conception yeah. people often have. I mean, also, I think at the very same time, we're kind of encountering these poetry skeptic students my sister, who is not an English major or an English teacher, she started a poetry open mic at the local tea shop in Royal Oak. And uh, so goldfish tea once a month, everybody would shuffle in with their poems. And you had, you know, like the guy who worked the night shift at the car factory. And you had a woman who worked in athletic rehabilitation for people and, and another guy who's an engineer and, and just, man. you had kind of a wide cast of characters with all different kind of poetic tastes. You had the guy who would get up and read his Longfellow pastiche every week, mm-hmm. you, you know? And so the one guy who worked on the factory line, he actually changed his work schedule to make sure he could come. And he said it was like the most meaningful part of his, his life, this poetry yeah. night. Yeah. So I guess that kind of showed that it could have the sort of, popular earthy appeal that you would have in like the ancient medieval or even i mean up until up until the modernists right now i'm writing my master's dissertation on c.s lewis and his poetics and poetry and he was really frustrated the modernists kind of tried to take story and comedy and instruction out of poetry and just put it off in this sort of fragmented imagistic academic realm by itself and so i think you know when some of those elements that appeal to people are involved, it becomes more popular. Yeah, absolutely. And before I say anything further, I'd like to address if there are any teenage boys who are rolling their eyes at the Iliad in school, I want to read the opening lines of Robert Fagel's translation. Rage. Oh, yes, yes. please. Gotta sing the rage of Peleus, son Achilles, murderous doomed that cost the Achaeans countless losses. I mean, come on, guys. Come on. What more can you want? Uh, but I really, you guys are speaking my language with all this because one of my biggest soapboxes is that we need to stop making poetry this sort of obscure academic discipline and make it something that normal people feel like they can read and interact mm. with. Right. But before we go right to that step, I'm kind of curious how you both got started in poetry because unfortunately, one of the marks of the age we live in is you can't just assume that everyone grows up loving poetry. So did you guys grow up with it or did you discover it at some point? Yeah, I think, I mean, I was read a lot of stories that rhymed. And I think people don't often think of the tales of Dr. Seuss or, I don't know, the poems of Robert Browning or just like the poetry that you get read as nursery rhymes. People don't think of that as forming your thought, but it actually really does. And so I grew up just loving the poems that my mom would read me as a kid. And I think that ended up informing my love of English. And in turn, I had this great English teacher in high school who had us actually memorize poetry. And that act of memorizing was kind of an act of falling in love because when you have to discipline yourself and study something over and over and over again and memorize a Shakespeare sonnet or a poem by T.S. Eliot, you know, a fragment by T.S. Eliot, you're forced to enter into their voice and take it on for yourself. And it kind of becomes this anthem. And so our teacher would have us recite poems and we would memorize them on our own, but we would also memorize them as a class and we would recite them every day. And and so it worked out if you attended class and you were there most of the time, you probably memorized the poem just by your attendance. And I think that was a really powerful thing because it started to inform the way that I thought about writing my own poetry. And it wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to 
take out this blank sheet of paper and I'm going to, you know, just throw a bunch of words on the page that are self-expression, but how can I craft this poem in a way that's like, you know, something that Longfellow would do or what, how can I make these rhyme schemes kind of interesting or maybe rhymes kind of weird. Maybe I don't want to write in rhyme scheme and I want to experiment with meter or something. And so because you see these great people doing great things, you kind of want to apprentice yourself to it, but by hearing and taking on those sounds for yourself, you're kind of inspired to do it incarnationally, I guess, would be the, the way to describe it. Yeah, yeah. So that's great. It sounds like you you started doing it because of, you know, early exposure to books like Dr. Seuss is great. Like, that's one of the things that it's really been driven home to me just in the past few years having young kids. Because I read Dr. Seuss every now and then when I was little, but we have a lot of books. And like, just before I put my Sun down for a nap just now. We read a uh, Dr. Seuss book. It's like, wow, this is great. He's a good wordsmith. And again, it's not yeah. the sort of thing you generally think of, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I uh, think so I was writing a lot of poetry in high school and a lot of it was really bad. And it wasn't until I started seeing what good poetry could look like that I, I realized there was a difference between just like, you know, writing down what you feel or what you think and kind of taking a stand, which is very tempting as a teenager and like, okay, how can I make this maybe relate to like one other person? Or maybe how can I make my ideas relatable to two other people? And I don't think you're giving your young self enough credit. You wrote that award-winning poem in the eighth oh, grade. Gosh, wow. yeah. uh, oh my. You always like to bring this up. And I just, it's, so it's, it's so fun. So Sarah, well, have to talk Sarah about was one of now. the, so I, I was like the kind of slacker that loved summer and didn't like the school year, but Sarah was the kind of, I love school. I am a teacher. I yeah. love school. And so she wrote a crowd pleaser that was not necessarily in line with her convictions that, that won in a, a poetry contest. Yeah. So I wrote this poem about how terrible the first day of school is. Even though you love the first day. And I, I was like, it's like a roaring train, a crashing wave, heat lightning on a hot day in May, <laughs> like all these terrible things. And then, you know, here it comes ruining my summer cool. Here it comes the first day of school. <laughs> oh my gosh. I really thought that would appeal to the board that was picking out, you know, the poems for the seventh grade contest. Good. It did. You, I you you're right. That is some next level thinking for an eighth grader, not writing what you want, <laughs> but writing to the evaluators. I mean, I'm almost inspired, but you did kind of sell out your convictions when you were eight, in eighth grade. So I don't know what to make of that. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, yeah, so, so, so I, yeah, cool. my, my love of poetry did not awaken quite so early. And, uh, Clint didn't even bring a backpack to school. In middle, in middle school. school. Yeah, <laughs> it was bad. It was extremely bad. And so I guess my dad always loved song lyrics and good songwriters and that kind of thing. So I suppose that's probably where I got the, the sort of obsession with music and songwriting when I was a teenager. And so more like a, I don't know, typical, less academic teenager. I think, you know, I had a notebook by my bed, but it was like, these are going to be songs someday and I'm learning to play the guitar. And so I had no, no knowledge of metrics or rhyme or any mm -hmm. poetic form. I was just writing things down. And then I think probably when I was in college at Valpo, around the same time that I became an English major, you know, I, like many sophomores in college, I loved Bob Dylan and I read his Chronicles. I mean, yeah. I remember him talking <laughs> about, you want to be a good writer. He talks about when he goes to Greenwich Village, you know, he's so poor that he just sleeps in everybody's floor. And in Chronicles, it just happens that he's sleeping in everybody's library floor and he's reading their books, their poetry and their novels until 3 a.m. or whatever. And I think that this really seemed like a good idea to me. So I think that <laughs> combined with me, me being in some poetry classes led me to just start kind of obsessively reading poetry. And I remember that first poetry class, my professor, Suzanne Childress, she's a poet. And Hopkins, Yates, and Elliot really stood out to me. I loved them. So I just started reading them a ton. And then I got involved on the um, submission board for the literary journal, The Lighter. And I then met... John and Ellen, who were kind of the two poets whose work I liked the best at Valpo. And we started a little group and they were good at writing poetry and I was terrible, but at least they would tell me, you know, kind of how to improve. And one of the things they told me was to memorize poetry, like Sarah said. Yeah. Yeah. No, that really uh, strikes a chord with me. I was, I was just thinking when you mentioned your love of Bob Dylan, when you were an English major in college, I'm thinking, okay, so let's take the Venn diagram 
of dudes who are English majors in college and Bob Dylan fans. It's like, yeah, it's, there's no overlap. Like, you can't be a dude who's an English major in college and not be a huge Bob Dylan fan. But uh, <laughs> I'm also interested that you seem to latch on to some of the same poets that I initially latched on to. Because, I mean, my story is very similar where, like, my family read a lot growing up. But it wasn't necessarily mm. poetry. Like, it was, it was novels. So it was, a lot of it were, like, classic novels. But not so much poetry. I discovered that more in, in high school, really. I, I remember the first thing that grabbed me was a translation of an Anglo-Saxon poem, The Seafarer. And mm. we started reading it in class. And I'm sitting there, like, 16, like, oh, my gosh. This makes me, like, feel stuff. What, what is this? I kind of like feeling these big emotions. And it sort of went from there. Such uh, a good poem. Oh, it really is. It really is. The, the Anglo-Saxons, they get me. Something about being fatalistic <laughs> and <laughs> talking Using about a lot how of brutal life is. And, oh, Yeah, I if you like the Tolkien, Kenning. then you probably love love the Kennings in that poem. It's like amazing. Oh. The like double substitutions for where it's like the whale road is the sea and that sort of thing. Oh, the whale road is one of my favorite word combinations that's ever been invented in the English language. It's another, it's another <laughs> like I'm sitting in class talking about whale road is like, yeah. Okay. New vista of, of experience sense. right here. Yes. <laughs> so now let's uh, sort of transition there back to like the point of the podcast, because uh, it sounds like uh, all of our stories are similar in the sense that, you know, we had some background with it, but we all feel like we all had to like discover it through, you know, good English teachers along the way or good professors. And it wasn't something that's like, yeah, of course I like poetry. Everyone likes poetry. Why wouldn't you like poetry? So. Maybe we could talk about what has changed. Like, what is the landscape of poetry now? And how is that different from what it had been for so long in so many other places before then? I think poetry is something that has fallen out of vogue because people feel like... There's a Billy Collins poem about this that I really like. I mean, he's satirical, so he he pokes fun at people who are trying to make too much of the, you know, the critical study of poetry. And so he has this poem about reading poems and it talks about, you know, I want, I want us to water ski across the surface of the poem, not <laughs> tie the poem to a chair and torture a confession out of it. And like, I kind of feel like that's true. If you're forced to do that too much in school, if you're not, you know, just going water skiing sometimes, yeah. But you're just doing the torturing. I mean, why would you ever want to love poetry if you just see it as this like crazy mental exercise that brings no joy? And so I think, mm -hmm. I don't know, Clint is more specialized in talking about like modernism and the fragments of poetry and kind of how you shore up those fragments. But I think ultimately our project is about connecting poets of the past with poets of the present. And so mm. in our episodes, we include a contemporary poet who is usually they're still alive or they have just died in the past couple of years. So they're very contemporary. And then we include, so we read their poem first, and then we include a poet who has influenced them. And usually that's someone from at least 50 years prior to when they were writing. And so the idea is looking for those common threads of either form or subject matter or content or, you know, tradition even, and looking for ways that poetry has kind of bridged the gap across time and how, you know, going forward, we could continue to carry on this conversation of poetry. And, you know, poetry is like little sound bites. It's little snapshots. It's not a big novel. You don't get this yeah. many, many pages to say things. And I think, I don't know, maybe Clint would push back against that a little bit, but I think... That's a good thing in a sense that it can be kind of a gateway drug to other literature. <laughs> and so in a sense, <laughs> allowing poems to be what they are and to kind of invite people into just enjoying the experience of reading something and feeling like you see yourself in it. Um, what were you going to say? You were going to say something though, Clinton. Oh, yeah. Um, I think one kind of helpful way to think about it, when Sarah and I were newlywed, we went to a conference at Notre Dame where... The poet James Matthew Wilson was talking about oh, yeah, uh, yeah. the nature of poetry. And he started off, like Sarah was starting off, talking about nursery rhymes. And what nursery rhyme? Oh, he talked about Ben Rhyme. So he said, he brought up Little Miss Moffat sat in her tuffet 
eating her curds and whey, along came a spider and sat down beside her. And he was just so entranced by the idea that you could <laughs> rhyme spider with beside her. Because that's like, <laughs> those things don't really rhyme. But like, if you say them a certain way, I guess they do. And he was taken in by that. Right. So I think part of his point with this, he went on to say that poetry has appealed to, to people. And it's been, I think he, he would say the highest art form or the because it, it appeals to our desire for memory, meaning, and music, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so he's saying, you know, we're talking about people when they're teenagers being sort of resistant to poetry or, or thinking poetry is not for them. It's just for the English teacher or whatever. But children universally love the, the music of poetry mm -hmm. and, and the stories in poems. And also if poems kind of connect with things in shared memory stories of kings and, and knights and queens and princesses. And, you know, that's something that's really appealing to children. And I think he was saying if poets were writing the sort of things that connected with these historic qualities of poetry in terms of memory, meaning and music, they would be much more widely popular and celebrated. And you kind of see that with in the 20th century, even after the modernists had started to make poetry more of an academic exercise. Mm -hmm. People like Robert Frost in the United States, yeah. wildly popular, right? And yeah, would draw like stadiums full of people who yeah. want to hear him read. Right. Which is just, I think that's kind of unfathomable to us. Like, what? Yeah, yeah. And, and so he's writing in form. He's telling good stories with good dialogue. And he also, I think people can identify with what he's doing. And in England here, John Betjeman was wildly popular. I think he was the best-selling English poet of the 20th century. And likewise, you know, he liked a poem with a good joke in it. He liked <laughs> a poem that told a good story. He liked, he liked a good rhyme. And so I think, and both of them apprenticed themselves to the poetic tradition. They didn't try to be originals or they didn't consider themselves geniuses or something. Yeah, and yeah. so I don't know. What, what do you think of that, Matt, do you think those are some qualities of poetry that can make it more popular or appealing? Absolutely. And as you were talking, I was thinking about some of the poems that I like, but I know that I'm not supposed to like around like my sophisticated, like literary friends. In, in their, <laughs> like in what? Their well, I was thinking especially Edgar Allan Poe, and I went through a oh. <clears throat> pretty severe Dylan Thomas phase. Right. Mm, Both yeah. of those writers have something in common where there's this heavy musicality, repetition, mm. almost like this clockwork mechanism for the rhyme schemes. And when you read them, again, when you're just like water right. skiing along the surface, like you were saying, there's almost like this entrancing aspect to them. It's like, and the moon never beams without giving me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise, but I see the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And you read it, it's like, oh my gosh, this is like a, a magic trick or something. But I know that I'm not supposed to like either of those too much because they're, you know, there's something slightly gauche about them at the Academy. And uh, same thing right. like you were saying with uh, Robert Frost, like it's traditional form. Lots of people loved him, told stories. But I, I know that you can't be like super sophisticated without it. I, I mean, with those things in, in the Academy. And that's just a really, really big shame because those are good things. You know, having a musicality mm -hmm. to your writing and uh, intricate rhyme schemes are a good thing. A narrative is a good thing. So can you guys give any thoughts about why this happened, where we we took this turn from poetry having lots of things that people like to poetry having fragments of unrhyming images that are only read by poetry professors? How did this happen? Yeah, it's a really interesting story, isn't it? So... <sighs> I'm actually looking into this for my master's dissertation and my PhD thesis. This is actually what I'm exploring in, in a certain way. And I think that you have a lot of different reasons why it happens, but you have the sort of French symbolists who think the sort of modern experience of industrialism and modern war and all these different things mean that you need to kind of what start the world anew and, and break with tradition and break with Western civilization. And I guess they're kind of questioning things that, you know, as, as Christians, we believe in terms of meaning and so on. Mm -hmm. And then you see 
in America, the images following in their footsteps, and you see in England, you know, Pound and mm. wants to break the back of the pentameter, as he quite <laughs> bluntly puts it. And so you have the, this movement between the, the French symbolists, the imagists, and the modernists, in which I think they're trying to represent the sort of breakdown that's happened in the West in terms of individualism, war, questioning meaning and questioning kind of the coherent story of our civilization and our personal lives and so on. And so they're trying to represent this in their form. James Matthew Wilson argues in The Fortunes of Poetry in an Age of One Making that Pound could have represented that in his content without throwing yeah. out the historic forms. And that would have been a much better move and less destructive to English poetry in the preceding decades. But he went for both. And so I think we've lived with those consequences in various ways. So you end up having kind of confessional poetry in free verse that's still trying to embody some of those sensibilities that becomes popular in the 60s. And then you have language poetry that just kind of goes hyper modern and, uh, you know, random grocery lists or something could be considered <laughs> poetry. So you have that kind of avant-garde wing in the development of English poetry that's really opposed to meaning and narrative and form as it's traditionally been understood in the history of English poetry. And some people, you know, tried to stand up to it, but they tend to be especially less successful in the United States. Over here, it's fascinating. It's not considered, I don't know, reactionary or weird to write in form in the same way that it is in the States. And so the two most prominent poets at St. Andrews, Don Patterson and Robert Crawford, we actually had an episode about Robert Crawford. Mm -hmm. They both write in, in meter and, and traditional forms all the time. And they're... Robert Burns is really celebrated. And yeah, I think oh, yeah. at least for the students that I teach, they're more attuned to expecting poetry to be rhymed. Like it's not mm -hmm. strange for that to be the case. Yeah, those, but, those lucky Scottish uh, kids, they don't know how good they have. <laughs> yeah, I've been trying to work out why that is over the past year. And I guess I'm still figuring it out, but it's interesting. I don't know. Maybe it's because they had a longer poetic history. Than I think do. that might that, be part of it. it was, the roots it was are deeper. More difficult to uproot or hmm. to redefine. We're still figuring all that out, but yeah. I think it's a really important question. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think, As yeah, as you were talking, I uh, kind of couple thoughts were popping into my head. One of them, there's this, I think it's a G.K. Chesterton quotation. He's talking about how revolutionaries of the younger generation are generally always right about what's wrong, but they're wrong about what's right. So <laughs> you, you can sort of see the points that, you know, the early modernists, Pound had a lot of defects in his philosophy in person, but you, let's assume that a lot of his accusations that he had against the poetic tradition were, were valid or about the way that the world was arranged. Ooh, pounds a bad right. example because his politics were bad, but you know, another, another, <laughs> another, 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 I'm not going to say a fascist had anything good to say about that, but let's say Elliot or someone, let's say Elliot sure. had some good ideas about the shortcomings of the world. Well, cool. Maybe he was right about what's wrong, but by basically breaking all the things about verse that people find attractive that that is very very wrong about what is right it almost reminds me about like brutalism with like the architecture school and this is a soapbox right. listeners i'm sorry I, I won't get fully on the soapbox but <laughs> a lot of that sort of hideous concrete globular architecture comes from philosophical convictions and maybe some right. of those philosophical convictions may have some truth in them the, maybe but they choose to express it in a way to, you know, by showing solidarity with the poor and, you know, taking down some elitist power structures, which are noble aims. They respond by buildings for poor people that are ugly. So it's like, guys, is this really what we want to do? You to express your philosophical commitments, you're just going to build ugly buildings for people. But uh, yeah, it's very fascinating how a lot of this, these ideas take shape and have all these unintended consequences you know it's a city with ugly buildings because of maybe some laudatory social ideas and it's people destroying others desire to read poetry in order to 
laud some poetic virtue of theirs. It's it's so, so weird how this happens. It is really strange. And, you know, we love Eliot, but he's writing free verse as somebody who had immersed himself in the tradition and had yeah. a good ear for meter and so on. So even though he's deviating from a lot of these conventions, he does it still in a way that's kind of, it's like a jazz musician, right? Like yeah. they know their scales before they play around with the scales. And so I think you talked about this in your romantics episode. A lot of the imitators are much, yeah. much worse and more destructive because they haven't immersed themselves in the tradition before they mm. experimented. So, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think you're right. The sad thing is that people flee from those buildings and they end up abandoned. Yeah. And the same thing is true about poetry and even English departments right now and yeah. colleges. And so I think, yeah, I think We're seeing the effects of it. Part of our idea with the poetry podcast is there are still poets who are telling good stories and, you know, writing in beautiful form and they're not as well known as they should be. So we want to yeah. spread the word yeah. about mm. some of the poets we love. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that, that's a great segue to something I, I wanted to get into. And that's just how you would encourage somebody, because I'm sure there are a lot of listeners here who... You know, they read some poetry, but don't consider themselves poetry experts or they they consider themselves artistic generally, but wouldn't think about writing their own poem. Like, I'll admit, I fall into that category a lot for poetry where I feel comfortable writing a lot of different prose styles. But I always feel like whenever I'm going to try to write a poem, I need some sort of formal training like, oh, I should really take a class on this or read a couple books on writing poems before I actually write a poem. So what would you say to folks who want to get going but feel a little intimidated because of our academicized uh, poetry? I think, first of all, it would, my suggestion would be to kind of start where I started, which is memorizing poems that you like. So it sounds like you've memorized the poetry of Edgar Allan Poe and Annabelle Lee. You know, if you really like William Blake and the tiger is just a poem that... <laughs> captures your heart, like memorize the tiger, memorize it with a friend, memorize it with your kids. Or if you have felt like poetry is maybe a little intimidating, start small. Like there's a lot of poetry that isn't very long. And so you don't have to feel like you're taking, like you're not memorizing the Iliad to recite before a banquet of people <laughs> over like a whole week, right? You can just memorize something by Emily Dickinson. You know, she's delightful and she's an American poet who uses rhyme in really interesting ways and she asks questions and you can turn around and ask those questions to the people that you're having dinner with or whatever. It's just, so starting with, I think starting small, I mean, maybe this sounds weird, but my grandmother loved poetry. You know, ask your grandparents, what poets did they grow up mm -hmm. memorizing in school or reading or did they enjoy? And you may be surprised that could open up a whole world of poetry that you had never been introduced to. That's so fun. Your grandma would, because Sarah's grandma knew that I liked poetry, she would recite her poems that she had written to her brothers who were in World War II. And so she would send them wow. these like kind of funny little six light line verse. light verse, you know, and she would still remember them <laughs> in her 90s. So we'd sit down for dinner and she'd quote them to me. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that uh, is great. I love that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for me too, uh, even though like memorizing gets a bad rap, you know, everybody who likes a pop song or mm -hmm. likes a rap song or whatever, they'll listen to it so many times that they know the words. And that's how you really come to, I don't know, have a strong bond with lyrics. And I do think it's similar with poetry. So I, I was telling, talking about my friend John and Ellen, they told me that you know, the reason that my poetry was not good because I hadn't memorized poems. And I think <laughs> that night I went home and, you know, I was kind of young and, and angsty at the time. So I started memorizing the, the love song of Jail for Proof Rock. Hey, Let us go with you and I. I memorized that poem too when I was young and angsty. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient authorized like poem. Lewis hated that, that uh, <laughs> analogy, by the way. He thought it was ridiculous to, to put such a perverse image in people's heads of, of the night sky. <laughs> <laughs> but to my master's in English, the professor who taught me poetry, he was a practicing poet, Ed Hepner, and he told this story about how he had memorized, I think it's the love song, where he says, I grow old, I grow old, I will wear the bottom of my trousers rolled. Yeah. Dude, uh -huh. Ed Hepner, as an 18-year-old entering his college dorm, <laughs> wrote that on the wall 
And he said, I don't know why. I wasn't old at all. I was 18 years old. He said, but I had memorized those words and they just really made an impression on me. And I was like fired up about it. And so I think, you know, once you get it in your bones like that, even if you might have a bad image from Lewis's perspective in your bones, there's something about it that... Yeah, the anthem of poetry. Like, um, yeah, I think yeah. Jerusalem is technically an unofficial rugby anthem over here. <laughs> and did those feet in ancient time <laughs> walk upon England's mountains? You know, like you'll get stadiums full of really athletic men singing those like lines of poetry from, yep, from I don't know, William it's just Blake. kind of, it's cool. I think it's cool. <laughs> yeah, from, it's just awesome. That is great. I, I love how straightforward that advice is because I'll tell you something that happened to me and it was, it was cool, but it, it also scared me. Um, so I did a semester abroad in college. I know that's ticking all the boxes you're expected to do, but I, I did a semester abroad in, in Oxford. And one of the mm. sort of seminars I took was by this sort of renowned poet, it was like Tom Pollan or something like that. And it was a fascinating lecture. It was called How to Read a Poem. So again, that wow. kind of shows you need to take a class by a celebrated academic in order to read poems. And we'd have a poem. We just sort of go through it in such fine comb detail that I, I forget which one of you was talking about, like tying a poem down and torturing it to get the meaning out of it. And that's what it felt like we were doing, where he'd go so in depth. And it, it was almost like he was doing a magic trick to make the poem like do stuff. And, you, <laughs> and in the moment, you're like, wow, this is amazing. This is so cool. Then you leave like. Wait, what? What what just happened? And plus, like poems seem very complicated and scary. I could never do one of those. But but yeah, <laughs> it, it doesn't have to be all of that. It can just be, hey, find some poems you like and memorize them, and then find other types of poems and memorize them, and then it just sort of gets inside your head. It's really it doesn't have to be that complicated. Yeah, yeah. And and then once you love poems, it can be fun to sit down with a, a friend at a pub at the foot of yeah. Pike's Peak and you know, ch <laughs> chat about them, right? I have oh, a absolutely. movie recommendation, if I may be so bold, that talks oh, about please. poetry. It's by one of my favorite movie directors, Roberto Benigni. He's this crazy Italian guy. And he directed this movie that came out in the 2000s called The Tiger in the Snow. And it's a really strange movie. And it's definitely like kind of an artsy type film. But the main character who is played by Roberto Bonini is a poet professionally and he's a professor. But his lectures aren't are just kind of like him yelling at the students and he's like, You gotta read poems to write poems and you know, don't ever don't try to write a love poem. What are you crazy? Like <laughs> write about the air conditioner, write about the clouds in the sky. Don't write love. No, don't even try it, you know? And I like showing that to my students because it's like you can take a really simple subject matter and you can make something really beautiful out of it. You don't have to aim for these lofty things like, oh, I'm going to write about, you know, war or something like, like just, <laughs> I think we feel like that's what poetry is about. Like it's about yeah, yeah. love and like betrayal or war, you know, like just take something small, like take something commonplace in the day to day yeah. and start with that. And then like, maybe then you can work up to like love and war and, you know, betrayal and all those other crazy things. Yeah, you see all, all all the listeners out there? That doesn't sound so scary, does it? Um, but we are winding down time. We have just enough time for one final thing. So I, I asked you both, you guys both write poems. I asked you both to pick a poem that was written by the other one of you and then, then read them. I think, frankly, I think this will be adorable. And then we can talk about what you like about the poems. Sarah has the beautiful reading voice, so she's going to do the reading. But we do have poems by both of us. Um, I think we'll, okay, we'll start with, with Clinton. It's called Kilmainham Jail, and it's from a scene when we were on our honeymoon. So, oh my. Kilmainham Jail by Clinton Collister. We stand in crooked lines outside the gate, where my new bride and I map out our day, as gap year Germans try to understand what their French friend in Denim means by hangry. The jailers call the Germans to file past a wall where Irish rebels hung and flailed. We spot a pub across the street and leave the line for this strange jail, which was once refuge for children and parents who swiped fresh bread from grocery carts to outlast the great hunger. The air feels good as we eat fish and drink, unsure if the line will die down in time, for us to catch a bus back to Suffolk Street. 
The waiter brings a second pint and winks. We see the cells and courtyard afternoon and make it back to Dublin for the first scene. The actors sit on stools and slur their words, forgotten lines about alcohol penned by bone-thin poets who wrote to honor jailed rebels, school teachers, priests, and starving farmers. The bearded actor swivels his stool and sings Kennelly's words, a ballad is a living ghost that demands a living voice. The crowd erupts as we collect our tabs and follow lovesick James Joyce down winding cobblestone streets. The red sun hangs low in the sky and hits the lawn, where goldsmith's copper eyes stare down at me entranced by the dead around us. Great, great. So Sarah, what, what made you choose uh, this poem in particular? Well, I think... I love this poem because it uses the word hangry, and I just think that is so great. <laughs> but I also love, I mean, it, I was there, obviously, so it takes me back to this great memory of, like, yeah. when you're on on a vacation, you have all these wonderful moments, and it all happens so quickly that you feel like it's all the same day or something like that. And just <laughs> the fact that we're having these experiences going on a literary pub crawl and visiting and, <laughs> an old jail where rebels were kept and, you know, just having these like really rich experiences and then their juxtaposition with just kind of ordinary things like enjoying a pint yeah. at a pub or eating fish or, you know, just these like extraordinary and ordinary moments kind of together and getting to participate in that is a real blessing and real joy. Yeah, it juxtaposing extraordinary things and ordinary things and also telling a narrative. So a lot of things yeah. we've been talking about. All right. So Clinton, you're kind of cheating because you're going to have Sarah read am, her own right. poem. But you, yes, you chose yes. it, so that still works. So why don't you, you tee up the poem, but before Sarah reads it. Okay. So these poems, I guess, are both more, we chose they pair well, more yeah. personal poems. <laughs> and so this one, chronologically in our lives, precedes the one that Sarah just read. And so... I think this one harkens back to when we started dating, you know, I was a somewhat new Anglican and we wanted to have a traditional Anglican wedding. And mm -hmm. this was strange to some family members. And this poem's kind of inspired <laughs> by our wedding. And I don't know, the um, challenge the of tradition. Of it. Yeah, yeah, the challenge of tradition. <laughs> it's called A Solemn Bride. Dad objected to solemnization in the section about our marriage vows. He wanted some words of celebration, words outside what tradition would allow. People will think it's a grave occasion. When life is tossed or lost instead of one, no one would detect my new elation with words I forsake all for love of one. The organ was tuned and a white dress bought. My teacher warned me we'd have no cash, and books would have to suffice. I thought it could be worth it for a love that lasts. I came into the church to find new life, and so left a solemn woman, a wife. Okay. Now, I feel like this is one of those poems, once again, setting a scene that's really, really straightforward to follow. I feel like a lot is hanging on the word solemn. So what, what did you mean to hang on that word? So if you go back to the, the old prayer book, it's called the solemnization of marriage. And mm -hmm. in contemporary usage, solemn sounds kind of serious and drab. Yeah. And so there was a little bit of pushback when our invitations had the word solemnization on them. <laughs> and my dad really did think it just, it was going to sound like a really boring wedding. <laughs> he said people wouldn't want to come. <laughs> Everyone come to the solemn and, event. <laughs> and so I think I like Sarah has a really good ear for meter and rhyme, and I think that comes through strongly. And I mean, what solemnization you rhymed with? Celebration. Celebration. You, you know, I don't know. It's really memorable. And I think it has a playful touch. A lot of people think poetry has to be really heavy and, and serious solemn, and solemn <laughs> yes. in the wrong sense of, of the term. And I think instead, you know, this is kind of telling a triumphant story. And it's playful along the way. And I think, I mean, as the poet, if I may be so bold, I think I'm, I'm saying that I like own that word solemn. Like I'm proud of it. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, that's the great, the final two lines there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
No, that was one of my favorite aspects, yeah. having the, you, you leaving a solemn woman. I just loved what you were doing with that. <laughs> and I, um, also, I loved how you were talking about it just now as the poet of the poem. I think I'm saying I like the, I like the <laughs> modesty you're having with the poem that you wrote. <laughs> All right. You so, never know. You, you know. You, you, want, you, want, you want to avoid that genetic fallacy. They teach all, all of us. <laughs> all English majors. English yeah. majors. Right? Well, there are times all when you fall off your water skis and they continue going without you. So <laughs> I'm kind of just accounting for that. You know, I was water skiing and then I just fell off by some accident. <laughs> I love it. I love. It. Well, actually, we're a bit over time, but that is okay. Um. So before we go, where can we find? Both of you all, either on, on the web or in print, or where, where are you? Give your own shout-outs for yourselves. <laughs> We're both on Twitter, and our Poetry for the People podcast is on Twitter as well, with this, just the handle Poetry for the People. I also edit a literary imprint mm. called Little Getting Press, and our first book came out this year called The Slumbering Host, and yeah, it, it actually yeah. features a few poems by James Matthew Wilson, mm -hmm. who we mentioned. And it also includes poems by a couple other heroes of mine. David Middleton is in there. And so that was a real honor. And we're going to have some more books coming out in the future. Uh, Great. Daniel Rattel, who helped me edit it, we're going to be publishing his next chapbook. So that should be fun. And you can find that on Amazon or wherever. All right. Great. I'm really looking forward to that. I was uh, reading some of the cover blurbs and everything ahead of this and that is something i'm really looking forward to so slumbering host and yeah slumbering let's host. all right well things are winding down at the anselm digital pub fires down to embers the customers are trembling home and you've polished off your final glass while composing your final limerick once again, believe to see this podcast of the Anselm Society. Check us out at anselmsociety.org and rate and review our podcast wherever you get them. Thank you all for joining us at Believe to See. We'll see you all next time.